Hi, I'm Eli Roth, and this is my career in four minutes. I've never actually worked for Troma. I'm friendly with Lloyd Kaufman, and I watched, showed Mother's Day at my bar mitzvah, and my friend Gabe Friedman is the editor at Troma, and they needed an audio commentary for Bloodsucking Freaks because the director, Joel Reed, was in some sort of money dispute and didn't want to do it. Gabe suggested me. He's like, well, why don't, you should have my friend Eli do it. And I said, well, what are you going to call me? Like, I haven't done anything. I was 25 years old. And they said, well, we'll call you Blood and Guts actor at Eli Roth. So I did a tremendous amount of research. I found all the actors online. I did like people search on Yahoo, which you did in 1996 or 97. And I put together all these really fun featurettes and I gave a, a commentary with all the information I knew about the movie. I actually got Joel Reed on the phone and talked to him. And Lloyd was so impressed with that. He was shooting, he's like, yeah, I'm shooting this movie Tales from the Crapper. Uh, why don't you come by and say hi? And with like anything with Lloyd, you're not showing up to be in the movie or to work with him. You stop by because Lloyd's in town and next thing you know, he's got a camera on you and now you're in Tales from the Crapper, which you never really planned on being in, but it's Lloyd, so you have to. I'll never forget that first screening in Toronto when the lights went out and people started applauding. I thought, oh my God, this is it, this is it. And afterwards, the people stayed through the credits and Dave Kerr from the New York Times said, that's the most fun I've had at a movie here since Brain Dead. I was like, wow. So then I walked out of that theater and I had eight studios fighting for the movie. It was surreal. I remember that very first scout when I went to Prague for the first time. And it was 2004, December. And I just got on a plane with this producer, Dan Frisch, who lived there. And we just went and scouted every location. And I had so much fun. We went out, it was like the first week of college. Like we went out to discos all night. I met beautiful Czech girls. We found all the locations. I had the whole thing figured out. Then I remember bringing the whole cast there that first week and everyone just going out and bonding and going crazy and, and having fun. And right down to the last shot, the last shot we were, we were down in the basement of this mental institution, which is, the wing had been closed down for 70 years or something. And we were down there and it was freezing. And as soon as we wrapped, Athor uh, and Jay Hernandez and Derek, they all popped champagne bottles and they poured them over my head. And I was standing there, freezing and I and just everyone was just laughing and had smiles in their face and I thought why didn't I pull a Stanley Kubrick and shoot this movie for a year and a half like why was I in such a rush to finish this film we were so sad and the whole crew was looking at me going we can't believe it's over mm -hmm. it really was like this uh, seven week party it was incredible I learned so much from Quentin as an actor that I think made me a better director that I took to the set of Hemlock Grove and the Green Inferno Quentin's main thing was rehearsing with you and the actors in the space before any of the crew get there. From there, you find the movements and where everyone should be, and from there, you start to set the camera. But you can't do it with the whole crew watching. You know, you just tell everyone, and, and Quentin said, look, the lighting guys, Bob Richardson gets his time, he gets an hour, the sound guy gets his time, I, want, I get my time on the set. And you tell the AD that's how it's gonna work. And if everyone's standing around for 20 minutes, then they're standing around for 20 minutes. But those 20 minutes that you take really, really save you during the day. Another thing I learned from Quentin was that you don't need a monitor. I shot Green Inferno with no monitor. We were in the jungle and we were in Peru and there was four or five hours of travel every day to and from the set. It was deep in the jungle. It was tarantulas. It was very scary to get to and from the set some days. It was 110 degrees. It was bugs eating you alive. It wasn't conducive to having a monitor. And very early on, I just thought, screw it. I, tr I trust my DP, I know the shot I want. If there's a shot I really want, I'm gonna shoot it myself, which I did a lot of the time. But we shot without a monitor and the movie turned out amazing. I'll never be able to direct all the stories I have in my head. And there are a lot of movies out there that are movies that I really wanna see. And producing is a great way to help other directors get out there. Like RZA tells me this idea for his kung fu, hip hop, fantasy movie, Man with the Iron Fist, and I thought, this movie has to exist. Whether or not people like it, whether or not anyone wants to see this, I have no idea, but this is such a cool thing that I think people are gonna enjoy for years and years. Like, if I was a 15-year-old kid and I saw that movie, I think it was the coolest movie. Now there are directors like Ed Gastonley on Last Exorcism 2 and Ty West who've made terrific films that not a lot of people have seen, and we can use these movies with my name on them as a vehicle to really help them get exposure, not just for this movie, but when people see the movie, they tend to go back and watch their other films as well.